Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Becoming Us. This is a program brought to you by BetterHelp, which is a provider of virtual therapy sessions. I'm Bambi Francisco Voisin, and with me is Christian Lamb. He is a BetterHelp therapist, and he will be facilitating today's conversation. Well, it's nearly August, and I want everyone to roll back the clock and think about it as March. Today is March and sit in the moment when COVID first impacted your life. And it's probably around the time when things were being taken away from you. For my personal experience, it was when I heard that several events were being canceled, specifically for my children. So my son, who was a junior in high school, his prom was canceled. And then for my youngest one, he was competing in the national ski championships. That event was canceled. And for a parent, it's really devastating. So I was very devastated because I wanted to take joy in their experiences and I wanted to take pride in their victories. And those opportunities to feel really good about myself as a parent, well, they were gone. And so back in mid-March, when things started shutting down, I started to process what was going on by writing an essay and I ended up titling it In Ordinary Times We Suffer Alone because I realized I wasn't suffering alone. This wasn't just me or my kids, everyone was suffering. And when I did that, um, you know, by comparison, my losses were really small. Like, you know, you could take the little violin out for me because those losses were extremely minor to the lost lives, to the lost loved ones, to the lost jobs. Millions of people lost their jobs. Um, Hundreds of thousands of people lost business deals, business opportunities. Um, Startups and entrepreneurs were ready to open up new stores, new business channels, um, new revenue streams. Those were gone. People lost homes and a lot of people lost purpose. A lot of people lost meaning. And so as I was writing this story or this essay, as I was going through this, one thing kept coming back to me. And that was this question, what am I doing with the time given to me? And more recently, my sister and I, I was going through something and my sister texted me and she said something like, she reminded me of that, it's a Bible verse and it's idle hands are the devil's workshop. She said playground, pretty much the same thing. And it really, prompted me to think I'm not going to be idle. I'm not going to sit here and let anyone you know, manipulate my feelings. I wasn't going to be idle because I didn't want to be impotent and I didn't want to be nihilistic. And so it really made me think, what am I doing with this time that's given to me? Because sure, the circumstances are not in my control, but I can control the way I view them and I can control my perspective. And so I hope that through, through this journey, through the five months that we're going to be doing this program, I hope we can all start to think about what are we doing with the time given to us? How could we change ourselves? And how can we change ourselves in relationship to others? And I hope that the stories that we're all sharing can help us be um, really change who we are internally, but also change us in relationship to one another.
So that final image was my family. And as you can tell, we're all on a road, on a path, on a journey, walking, walking through life. And I could have easily replaced that with an image of teammates or coworkers or classmates or neighbors. But it, the image was to capture the story. Another essay I was writing in mid-April when we were starting to reopen the economy and it was in this new normal who do we become and i kept going back again to that same question what am i doing with the time given to us and the things i kept thinking about were fear um anger and risk risk of covid getting sick and i started asking myself, what am I doing in the face of that? And so was I going to face and embrace fear or was I going to embrace hope? Was I going to be angry or was I going to get prepared? And was I gonna look at threats and risk or was I going to look at them as opportunities? Again, it all came down to what was I doing with the time given to us? And so hopefully, you know, hopefully we could, those are some of the stories that I can hear that we'll all be able to share with one another. What are some of the, what are we doing with the time given to us? And, and we can change our perspective um, and not look at those, um, at these times as times to, um, you know, to be impotent and to be nihilistic, uh, to be grateful and, uh, and not resent the circumstances we're in. So with that, I'm going to actually be grateful for one company, and I have to do this because uh, they are the ones that are supporting this program, and that's BetterHelp. 
And so let me put in this plug for them, but I have to do that because you know what, it's a really great service. Um, BetterHelp basically provides thousands of therapists wherever you are, they match you with a specific therapist for your specific needs. So they evaluate um, your struggles and then they will uh, match you with someone they think is suitable, but you can always select your own. Um, it's really convenient and it's really affordable, far more than a traditional therapy session because you're, you're at home. Um, you can chat with them, you can set up a video call with them and you can message them and you can do these group webinars. Now, look, you might have friends, you might have a group, I have a really close knit family. I can text them all the time and say, hey, I'm going through this. I just lost an opportunity. I lost something. And they don't answer right away. It's pretty asynchronous as texting is. But then they come back and they come back with really impactful words. And if you don't have that, and not everyone does, I think better help with their therapist. They can provide those kind words, those empathetic words. So I think it's really useful for everyone during this time. And so I'm really grateful for them. So now to this, to becoming us. Today, this session for July, it is fear, anxiety, loneliness. In August, we're gonna cover relationships and I'm going to introduce introduce the therapist there later in the program. September will be parenting, October work-life balance and November purpose and sense of agency. Um, and we will be, hopefully, if you have stories, um, in those specific topics and you want to share, uh, please raise your hand, let us know. And, um, and, and of course, you can even touch on those topics during this program as well. Um, so now with that, I want to bring in Christian Lamb, who's here, who's going to be giving a presentation. So Christian, take it away. All right. Thank you, Bambi. I appreciate that. Um, and I really appreciate being here with you all today uh, just to be able to kind of start this discussion and to kind of provide an intro for this. Um, and these important topics is pretty awesome for me. Um, and uh, that's basically what I want to do here with just providing this presentation. I just want to kind of lay it out here pretty simply and uh, pretty quickly so that we can get into more of a discussion with each other. Uh, you know, I have, um, you know, roughly about uh, five years of clinical experience with counseling uh, and providing online counseling for about the last two and a half years uh, through the Better Health platform, as well as my own uh, counseling service. Um, but really what I wanna um, get to is the stories. So I wanna get to um, hearing from all of you, hearing how you're, you've been struggling and possibly answering some questions or sharing some um, some of those struggles that we can kind of um, normalize this a little bit because we're in a very, very wild time. I have not experienced anything like this in my 40 years, uh, 43 years on this earth. So uh, a lot of this is some things that we are um, suffering together, just like Bambi was saying. So uh, let me jump into the presentation. Okay. So we need to have uh, the, sh the screen sharing uh, approved. Okay. Okay. All right, so it's just having, doesn't look like it's allowing me to share the screen. Here we go. Okay, there we go. All right, sorry about that. All right, so Understanding loneliness, fear, and anxiety. Uh, so basically, again, I just want to kind of provide some kind of uh, brief intro so that we can have some kind of platform to kind of dive into more of a discussion. So 
we'll start with loneliness. And I have a few quotes that I want to kind of start with that I've found to be meaningful to me. Uh, and I thought that might kind of spark some, um, some discussion later as well. So from Larry Yeagley, uh, it's like a hunger, loneliness. All of us have a healthy hunger that draws us to a meal. This is normal and it signals we need human contact with our community. So just kind of, again, kind of normalizing this loneliness feeling uh, and uh, saying that it actually has some purpose. It does serve some purpose for us. And then from, uh, from a blog that I found, uh, everyone in our lives is transient. They cannot be a substitute for our own sense of peace with ourselves and the world. Fundamentally, it is our duty as individuals to travel our own path and to navigate it safely, courageously, gracefully, and as best we can. So we all um, are going to be uh, um, alone at, at pretty much uh, many times in our life and to kind of learn how to uh, be alone and be isolated and do it well, uh, where we learn to grow in those moments and we learn to uh, reach out in those moments is, uh, is, is a constant path that, and a constant journey that we, um, that we share as individuals. So fear, we are not afraid of things, but of how we view them. And another quote that I found, fear to a great extent is born of the story we tell ourselves. Uh, so kind of looking at, you know, what's the subjective experience there for, for each one of us, what's going on in our minds uh, in regards to fear, um, and uh, how are we making it worse? How are we making it better? And then the last one, at the basic level, fear guides our fight or flight responses and helps to keep us safe and alive. So again, going back to uh, fear loneliness, fear, and anxiety, all can be very um, subjective experiences, but they also serve a purpose. And we'll look at that a little bit later. So anxiety, our anxiety does not come from thinking about the future, but from wanting to control it. So looking, looking at, you know, again, what we're doing in our mind, what's the story we're telling ourselves in regards to uh, the thoughts that are coming up in regards to fear, in regards to anxiety, uh, you know, ensuring and making sure that our experience internally uh, is, is uh, positive, is optimistic. Uh, these are all things that we do have uh, some control over um, and that we can really create a more positive experience and create a, a more enriching and um, manageable experience internally. And then the last one here, anxiety is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. I love that quote, the English proverb. All right, so let's get into what is loneliness? What is anxiety? What is fear? So with loneliness, it's a state of mind characterized by a dissociation between what an individual wants or expects from a relationship and what an individual experiences in that relationship. So how meaningful are your relationships, basically? Are you getting what you need from, from each relationship that you have, or is it just a very surface level uh, thing that you, you experience? And then the second point here, the feeling we get when, when our need for rewarding social contact and relationships is not met. Uh, again, uh, are you really um, allowing yourself to create uh, relationships in regards to um, you know, your feelings internally? Are you allowing yourself to be vulnerable so that you can create some depth with your relationships and not feel that, that isolation, that aloneness, that loneliness inside? Uh, and the last, last point here in regards to loneliness is a literal, it's a literal or perceived sense of being alone or isolated that causes an unpleasant feeling of being disconnected. So not having that connection, not feeling that um, again, that depth in your relationships um, is something that's going to really cause that, that loneliness feeling or um, cause it to really uh, exacerbate. And then moving on to fear. What is fear? It's, it's a natural and powerful and primitive emotion that alerts us to the presence of danger or threat of harm. So again, uh, it is something that is, is natural. It's something that can be very, um, 
very much uh, have a purpose for us. It can keep us from, uh, from harm. It can keep us from uh, very challenging or unsafe situations. Um, however, on the other end, fear can be a real and imminent threat or it can be imagined and created psychologically. So again, with the stories, what are we telling ourselves in, in regards to these, uh, these situations, uh, whether they're actually in our environment or something that we're telling ourselves? Um, how are we um, exacerbating the issue? How are we allowing fear to uh, take control of us? And then moving on to anxiety. What is anxiety? It's a, also a normal and healthy emotion. And anxiety also can become a clinically diagnosed disorder that's characterized by excessive anxiety and, uh, and worry more often than not for at least six months. So this we're talking about like a general anxiety disorder. Uh, it's being, being very challenging to control with at least three specific physical and cognitive symptoms. Some of those being restlessness, fatigue, impaired concentration, irritability, muscle aches, and difficulty sleeping. Um, so again, anxiety can be a very healthy thing. It can help us to plan. It can help us to be more prepared for things. When it becomes excessive, when it becomes something that we allow to get out of control, or something that gets out of control naturally because it's a disorder, uh, then it's time to maybe seek some help. <clears throat> so what effects has COVID-19 had on our inner state? <clears throat> so of course they have the, the social physical distancing um, that's creating uh, much more isolation and can uh, create more loneliness for us, can create more fear, anxiety, fear of uh, catching this uh, this virus, fear of um, what's going to happen with our work situation. A lot of us can work remotely, but some of us can't. The restaurants are closing down. Businesses that I've seen in our community have, have closed down that have been there for years and years and years. It's, it can be a very scary time. Um, staying at home, stay at home orders, the limits on traveling. Uh, me and my family just traveled recently from Hawaii all the way to North Carolina to be with family that are having like we're having an emergency situation with our grandparents. That trip was very fear provoking. Oh my goodness. You know, everyone is wearing masks. We were wearing goggles and people were wearing face shields uh, to try and protect themselves. Um, you know, we had to really question, is this going to be something that is going to be helpful? Or are we going to cause more issues? Uh, so a, a lot of uh, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, worry that we had on our end. So uh, again, kind of, kind of with this COVID nineteen, th this is all new. These are all new precautions we're having to take. Um, <clears throat> limits on hospital visits. This has really hit home with us. My grandmother's in the hospital after a uh, ha having a stroke. She's been in the hospital for about six weeks now with very limited contacts, really no contact face to face. Been able to see her through um, her window, um, and uh, it, it, you can see how how much it's really kind of wearing on her. You can see how um, how she doesn't know what to expect next. So the, the, all of these things are really impacting our lives and our internal state in a big way. Um, working remotely, fear of, of connecting. Um, how, when, how is this gonna, gonna change, you know, in the, in the months to come? Uh, is, is, is COVID gonna keep, um, keep exploding in our, in our country, in our world? Uh, or are we, is it gonna be dialed back? Once it does dial back, are we, um, how are we gonna handle that, that connecting again? Are we gonna be able to give handshakes? I haven't been able to get a handshake in I don't know how long. Uh, you know, I'm still keeping my distance from people and everyone is. So how are we gonna connect in a meaningful way again? These are questions definitely I wanna um, cover in the discussion. Um, remote learning, if anyone has children, uh, this is a huge, huge thing. Uh, you know, how are we gonna um, teach our kids and still keep everyone safe? Um, this, this remote learning is, is, again, is all new and we went through it in, uh, in the fall trying to um, put on the hat of becoming a teacher for our, our kindergartner. Uh, not an easy task and um, definitely something to keep considering because uh, there is gonna be a bit of remote learning as well. Um, go back to that last point, focus on family unit for meaningful connection. 
So this is, everything's not negative, right? There are a lot of positives that can come out, like what Bambi said in the, uh, in the intro. Uh, you know, maybe we, this doesn't, it, this gives, it takes away a lot of our wants, uh, but it gives us a lot of the things that we need as well, which is uh, more meaningful family connections. Uh, you know, we're at home more often with our, with our family now. We're uh, eating together, we're seeing each other more. So how are we creating, how are we um, taking this opportunity and really creating those meaningful connections with our children, with our loved ones. <clears throat> the being lonely versus being alone. Uh, it's, it's, a big, um, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing to, to consider. You know, just because you're um, alone doesn't mean you're gonna be lonely. If you're alone, you can really use that time or you can feel internally that you can use that time to um, better yourself, to learn something new. Um, and then if someone's, if someone's lonely, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are alone. If you can see in this picture here, you know, you could be surrounded by people, but still not feel that you have the, the capability or the skills to open up to people, to create those meaningful connections. Just some brief research and statistics as well, and this is regarding loneliness. Uh, loneliness was found to be more dangerous to our heart than obesity, and more damaging is smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Uh, this is noted in the um, Cigna's <clears throat> study uh, that they did in 2019. Um, also uh, in that study, uh, which was based on basically a 20 item questionnaire on uh, um, loneliness, it's a loneliness scale that they use. Uh, they discovered that 61% of Americans classify as lonely. 49% said they always or sometimes feel they lack companionship. Those are huge numbers. Those are really big numbers. 47% uh, reported their relationships are not meaningful. 45% said they sometimes or always feel they are not no longer close to anyone. Uh, for me, these are uh, these are things that really impacted. <clears throat> Um, my inner state and really wanted, I really wanted to kind of reach out more to people. And I generally do. Uh, sometimes I like to have my alone time and that's okay as well. Um, but I have family that I haven't seen in years. Uh, we live on an island in Hawaii, so we're pretty isolated normally. Um, but it, reaching out is, is something that uh, is not just for, for you, it's for everyone else as well. Yeah. We have grandparents that uh, haven't, haven't been around people in, in quite some time. We're able to come over here and spend time with them. And that's really huge for them. I can see the smiles, hear it in their voices, how it's really uh, something that's energized them. <clears throat> what are some of the health issues that, that come along with fear, with loneliness, with anxiety um, that isn't checked? Cardiovascular disease, some stroke issues, sleep disturbance, long-term inflammation, uh, Alzheimer's um, progression, uh, significant mental health concerns, of course, with, um, uh, with, with loneliness, uh, um, suicide risk, uh, with, with anxiety and fear, having that, that anxiety that's gonna cause you to socially isolate. Uh, and then, of course, the loneliness sets in. So this can be a very vicious cycle and can really cause some mental health concerns that uh, can be life-threatening. So again, things to really consider. <clears throat> so getting to the roots, feeling lonely, and this is really just a kind of a, a repetition of what I've already said, but feeling lonely, fearful, and anxious is a natural reaction, right? We need to normalize this. It doesn't have to be something that we, you know, we don't have to be fearful of fear or uh, anxious about our anxiety. These are very normal things that come up. On the other hand, feeling lonely, fearful, or anxious is a subjective story as well. So we have some control over how much this, uh, how, how widespread this gets for us, how deep this goes, how long this uh, continues for us. And these, there's things that we can do and we'll kind of check those out as well. So how do we recognize the loneliness, the fear and anxiety when it's arising in ourselves and, and others as well? Uh, internally, we're gonna feel isolated. We're gonna feeling we don't have the ability to connect with others. 
Uh, we're going to have you, you feeling that self-doubt, that low self-worth, uh, really feeling down, having our mood um, uh, really decrease, feeling drained and exhausted, um, not having the, the, the strength to really go out and connect with people anymore, um, sleep disturbances, uh, feeling sick more often, <clears throat> um, more irritability. Uh, especially with the anxiety and the fear. I've noticed this recently. Uh, we've had a lot of things going on here, trying to take care of my, my grandfather, trying to make sure my mom's okay. Have my grandmother in the hospital, we're trying to visit and kind of pick up her mood. A lot of things on our plate. So I've noticed that um, with having that worry, having that anxiety um, at a high level, I'm more irritable, I'm shorter with, with my wife. Um, and to be able to kind of be mindful enough to notice those things, uh, gives you a chance to correct it. it, gives you a chance to give yourself what you need so that you can come back to a place where you're at more at ease, that you can function at a better level where you're not going to be um, allowing that anger to come out in, in unhealthy ways. Uh, the restlessness, uh, which can be physically and mentally, when you start to note again, having that mindfulness about you that you can notice when you start to become physically restless, you're going from place to place, you're trying to move faster to try and get somewhere, you're trying to drive faster. If you can start to, if you can notice these things, you can kind of reel it in a little better. Mentally, of course, as well, when your mind is just racing, racing, racing from one thing to the next, trying to remember this, that, you can take a breath, you can really uh, check in with yourself more often than you can, uh, notice these things before they spin out of control and become a snowball. Substance misuse, uh, something that can, again, keep you even more isolated, lonely, or it can be kind of a self-medication where you're trying to uh, handle these, this fear and anxiety and lessen it in some way. Making more purchases uh, to try and feel, fill some kind of void that you might feel from the loneliness, uh, from the fear or the anxiety, and the negativity bias. It's a big one. Uh, I work a lot with clients on this. Uh, you know, you can really notice it real quick when people are saying that things always go wrong. This always happens to me. When people are saying that, it, it's really that kind of that negativity bias. Your mind is kind of switched to seeing things in the negative because you just don't feel that things are have been going right for a long time, and you you, you don't see any way out of it possibly. So if you can notice those, those um, even those words, when you say things like always, never, um, and when it's negative like that, uh, if you can check yourself, if you can really notice these things, you can kind of turn it around. <clears throat> so how to address these internal states? Finding something positive, fun, constructive to do, kind of get back into the, the passion of life, the things that you really enjoy. I can lift that mood, can really kind of build that confidence. Acknowledge and monitor our self-talk with journaling or with uh, practicing mindful acts throughout the day. Uh, assessing and acknowledging the depth of the issue. Uh, this is something that counseling can really help with. <clears throat> so counselors there to kind of help to, to be that mirror for you, to help you to uh, notice these things that you're doing that are not very constructive for yourself and help you to set goals to, uh, to start um, initiating better, uh, better habits, uh, initiating more interventions that are gonna help you work through it. Um, finding ways to engage, and this can be really with, uh, with the loneliness and kind of the disconnect, finding ways to engage, calling family, finding a group, volunteering. And uh, with COVID, of course, this has really kind of been minimized and it's been cut off in a lot of ways. Um, so we still have to find those things that we can do um, and focus on those because there are still ways to connect with family. We can still have Zoom calls. We can still uh, text message daily to kind of check in or weekly to check in. Uh, there's still groups that you can volunteer with, you know, reaching outside of yourself instead of uh, really focusing on you, let's fo focus on other people so you can volunteer and help out. That altruism can really, really be beneficial for your own um, inner state. And continuing to engage in healthy behaviors. Um, uh, I do this with clients quite often. You know, if, they're, if their mood is very low, if they're really struggling, I have to check in with them and, and find out, you know, 
how's your routine going? You know, are you still taking care of yourself? Are you still uh, sleeping well? Are you still trying to get to bed at a decent hour? Are you still waking up? Are you still exercising? Are you still fixing yourself meals? Uh, if you can continue to keep that, uh, that basically a normal routine or your normal routine going, uh, then a lot of times you can ride that, that wave of fear, anxiety, or loneliness and depression out. So how can we help others? Talking about the altruism and really kind of reaching out, uh, showing up, reaching out, empathy versus compassion. So uh, compassion basically, uh, real quick, compassion is uh, basically empathy in action, okay? And how can you do that? Through compassionate listening. Um, and how can you practice compassionate listening? You can do so with through compassionate questioning. So really just being curious with someone, being um, uh, alert to if someone looks like they are having a bad day, at least reaching out and just saying, hey, how are you doing? I noticed that uh, you know, you're not smiling like that you used to, or your eyes are just focused on the floor. You know, what's going on? And just being curious with people and really kind of checking in. Checking in is huge. And I just wanted to bring up the kind of uh, one of the things that I, I've kind of come across in the last um, couple months, I guess, uh, which is psychological first aid. I first heard this, I think, from Dr. Varma. Um, and uh, she, she says that um, psychological first aid, you know, we talk a lot about just regular first aid for physical issues, but having that psychological first aid can really be helpful for making sure that we are uh, taking care of each other on a, on a kind of a grander level. So providing it a, a supportive, compassionate presence for people. Um, preventing stress from worsening <laughs> in the moment. De-escalating acute distress. Um, a lot of times if you don't have to be a trained counselor in order to um, help to de-escalate someone. A lot of times it's really just about listening listening with compassion so that compassion of listening so that you can actually just show up for someone and let them to you know feel heard um assisting someone in getting more supportive care so uh there's plenty of places that we can <clears throat> we can reach out to if, if someone is having an acute crisis uh, of course 911 is something that we can use uh we can use the crisis line also uh, the 24-hour crisis line, if someone is uh, having thoughts of harming themselves, we want to make sure that we are there for them and that we actually get someone there that can um, get them to a place where they're going to be safe. Um, psychological first aid in action. How do we kind of put this into action? So we ensure we remain calm and speak calmly to someone. <clears throat> we don't want to be kind of up here when someone's feeling, feeling down here and just, um, we don't wanna be frantic. We wanna show them that we can be calm and we can uh, take in what they're saying. We can provide that compassionate presence for them. Uh, listening actively and empathically, so kind of summarizing what they, they're saying, really listening to what they're saying and let, letting them know that you're listening. Um, it, it, showing someone that you understand them and showing someone that you really care to listen uh, can really work wonders for people. And it's a lot of what we do as counselors as well. Uh, don't interrupt unless it is to de-escalate. So really let someone tell their story. A lot of times, maybe if someone's isolated right now and during this time, they might not have someone to talk to to kind of tell their story. So just to giving them that, that space is really important. Be patient and mindful. Seek to understand and acknowledge their difficulties and ask what they need. Something simple as just asking that question can really um, be very beneficial. <clears throat> and then more actions that we can do for um, psychological first aid, asking them who you can connect them with. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, um, maybe it's uh, to get them to a safe place, to a, to a hospital where they can be cared for appropriately. Uh, ask about safety and any intention for self-harm. Uh, ask, just asking that question can really help to keep someone safe. And it need, needs to be kind of normalized more because sometimes people think that that is going to cause someone to think about suicide and think about taking their life. Um, but that just hasn't been shown to be the case. 
um, really, if you ask that question, then it can really save someone's life and give them that chance to talk about these thoughts or these feelings that they're having. <clears throat> Knowing beforehand who you can call for emergencies. So, um, so we know we can call an ambulance, we can call 911. Uh, for uh, physical symptoms of kind of first aid. We know we can have a first aid kit handy. So preparing for psychological first aid as well, knowing the crisis line that you can call, having it programmed in your phone, uh, having people you can call uh, beforehand if you're the one that kind of gets, is prone to fear, anxiety, uh, depression, things like that. Um, and then follow up with the other people as well. Let them, you know, take their phone number down. Let them know, hey, I'll follow up with you. I would like to follow up with you tomorrow. And that can really, uh, really show someone that you actually are compassionate, that you actually do care. <clears throat> so what's next? So my hope is the next time you encounter loneliness, fear, anxiety in yourself or in someone else, that you are present with that feeling, knowing that it's, it is a feeling that is uh, there for a reason a lot of times um, and then acknowledge the difficulty and acknowledge the challenge of kind of handling that emotion or handling that feeling inside um, asking what is needed you know, checking in with yourself regularly and asking what's needed is a, is a great tool to use uh, to ensure that you're kind of at ease more often and asking other people what they need if they're in crisis or if they're struggling uh, again, can be a really, really powerful tool. And then take action. Take action to, uh, to get yourself what you need. Get yourself to a counselor if that's what you need. Uh, get someone else to a, a, a mental hospital if they can kind of regain that, that stability. Um, ask what is needed take that, and take that action. And that's all I have. So from here, I really, um, I would like to open up the floor. I don't know, Bambi, if you have anything else to add, but I'd like to open up the floor to discussion and um, for other people telling their stories, telling their stories of what they've been experiencing during this, this crisis that we've been having um, and really see, uh, you know, if we can kind of really come together as a group and provide some support around that. Hey, I think they can raise their hand. There's definitely few who are prepared to share as they said that they would share, which is great. I wanted to touch on really quickly what you said though, Christian, about the negative bias. And what I hear a lot these days is I don't have a choice. And it's, it's just really such a defeatist lens and a view of the world. And so, and I have gone through my own um, struggles and something that just really hit me recently, actually this week, was um, this idea of sitting in that space, sitting in that negative space, sitting in a dangerous space. And we may not want to, but I think we're meant to be put in that space largely because we have to learn, um, you know, what it is we can actually do to be proactive about our circumstances. But then also it's that delayed gratification, sitting in that delayed gratification. There's a lot of learning in that too. Anyway, that was my experience this week is that um, I do have a choice and, um, and, but sometimes I'm not, not quite sure what that, what the choice is. Um, so I have to sit in that negative space for a little bit before it becomes clearer to me. Uh, and, and for me, and, and you can share, others can share for me, that's really around prayer um, and sitting in prayer. Um, to really get a good sense of the direction that I'm, I'm told to be going. So with that, I, I, I think that there are a number of people here who want to share. And I want to start off with Don, because I know he, he has a, a meeting as well, but I always, Don uh, joined us last time. But would you, would you mind sharing a little bit about your journey and what have you been doing during this time? That's you, Don. Oh, my... Thanks. Thanks so much. It's nice to see you, everybody. So, um, wow, there's so much to say, so little time. Um, I think one of the things, I'll piggyback off of you, Bambi. Uh, it's interesting. This time of COVID and social unrest has come together to what I think is formed a, a perfect storm 
at least for my world. Uh, I was a former New York City guy who was born there, uh, who likes to go to go, 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 and brought that down to North Carolina. Um, COVID has certainly uh, encouraged me in ways that maybe I hadn't started to slow down on my own. And as a result of the slowing down, then we have this social injustice piece that has been around for, you could do the research over 300 years, this isn't something new, but it really has come to the forefront. And um, so it's given, uh, I think, the world an opportunity in this slower world that we have to put into practice what I think is one of the greatest gifts and, and wisdom pieces I've ever gotten is from uh, Jesus's brother, James. He says that uh, we should all be quick to listen and slow to speak. And I've spent the last, and I've been doing this for years, but COVID has certainly helped me to do this, uh, speak with people, but really do a lot more listening than speaking. And by listening with a heart to understand everybody's situation, whether I agree or not, it's not the point. I can go in with that mindset. Um, then I get to learn. And then you get to have the perspective of another human being. And really, that's what all this is about when we're talking about humanity. And when we get to put this into practice, then we get a chance to see people for really who they are, where they come from. Um, funny, my wife mentioned a, a movie, Crash, uh, this past weekend. And I don't know if you all have seen that one, but it's pretty interesting um, where you see everybody's backstory. And I think if we all took the time to learn everybody's backstory, we wouldn't look at a, 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 an individual and just, this is my first impression, it's the only impression I have. Well, that's what people say, but um, the way we were made was not just to give our first impression. It's not who we are. You know, our first impressions, hey, they are what they are, but that's just a piece of who we are. And I think COVID has really allowed, uh, really in a nutshell, the time, the opportunity to slow down, to seek to understand by listening. And I don't have to agree with anything that comes my way, but I do need to love. And I think to love is to consider the other person, where they're coming from. I had a phone call from one of my best friends in New York last week, just out of the was shop, grocery shopping. And he called me up and I haven't heard this temperament out of him. He's a fairly well-reserved, uh, I call him a brother from the South, but he's living in New York City. He's in my wedding. And he was just, I, I just listened for about five minutes without even almost breathing because he was just so, had to get stuff out and he chose to call and all I had to do was listen. And uh, at the end of that, we had our, we went back to a, a more normal conversation for us from our relationship of nearly uh, 30 years. And uh, so I just, I think that's what I've learned is to not only slow down during COVID, but really to slow down. I started doing that before COVID, COVID said, let me really help you slow down and really be better to listen. And I've learned a lot. I'm so grateful to uh, everyone who's been willing to share their story because everyone's a, got their own DNA, a beautiful story. And I think we can allow the new normal, which is what? Rioting and hate and all that. That's not a new normal. That's, I don't want to be a new normal. I just want to be the person that loves people. And hopefully, you know, people love me back. And if not, that's okay too, you know? I don't know if that's a good kickoff, Bambi, but that's my thought. Yeah, what comes to mind is just don't be quick to judge. Um, I think people are just too quick to judge and they see headlines and they walk away just um, with that headline in mind. Um, they don't read the news. They see people and they see the impression. They don't take a deep dive into who that person is. So that's my takeaway from, from your story. I would, I think Garrett, um, I'd love to bring Garrett in and Don, you know, stay here as well. But Garrett, I know um, we had a, some conversations and I think he can touch on some of the things that you mentioned. So Garrett, are you there? Yes, Bambi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, great to see you, Garrett. Yeah, well, thanks for, thanks for having me. Uh, this is a really encouraging conversation to, to be part of. My, my emotions over the past few months have really been all over the place. So uh, when COVID first set in, my sister, who's older uh, by seven years in her early 40s, was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so you've got this 
pandemic that no one knows what to do with and people were still trying to figure out the large implications. Um, and so, you know, it impacts everyone across the world at the micro level, at the macro level. And then on a very personal level, uh, my sister is diagnosed. Uh, and, and then, you know, on top of that, um, as research started to uh, become more public, you started to hear about the implications of COVID on, you know, people of color on, on black communities and Hispanic communities. And so, you know, part of me was just sort of trying to make sure that I was taking this situation seriously, that my family was taking it seriously. You know, there were some studies coming out saying that it could lead to uh, increased blood clotting, uh, uh, <laughs> a heightened level of blood clotting in African Americans. Uh, you know, I, I take blood thinners every day for pre-existing uh, um, um, uh, blood thinner uh, um, coagulation issue, uh, have family history in it. So it just, it really elevated my concern for myself, for my family. Uh, we're going to Stanford tomorrow uh, to, to have my children tested to see if there's any uh, link between my medical condition and, and anything uh, in, uh, you know, that they might encounter. So, you know, just lots of questions, lots of concerns. And, and then as Don mentioned, it's almost a perfect storm of uh, a, a economic crisis, a health crisis, and now you have this social and cultural crisis that we confront. And, and you know, one fear that I, I certainly have is um, the, the uh, as you put it, you know, the, the victim narrative that has, that has uh, gotten so much coverage. Uh, it, it almost seems uh, like, uh, you know, more and more people are feeling that they are constrained by their circumstances or constrained by history. And in and, and pushing that narrative and embracing that narrative, you rob people of agency, of the ability to, to change their circumstances and believe that, you know, there is still opportunity and hope and redemption for themselves personally and for our larger society. And, and you know, I've, I've just been, been concerned that, you know, we as African Americans, we as Americans in general can't lose sight uh, of, of that idea that we are not constrained by history, we are not constrained by our circumstances, we can overcome them. Uh, and, um, and, and we can't get stuck uh, and mired down in, in this notion that uh, everything that happened in our past will, will you know, continue to, to shape and dictate our future. So uh, those are some of my thoughts. You know, I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, again, thank you, Bambi, for having me as part of this conversation. I don't know if anyone had, I, I, I so agree with you. I had written something down that we can't erase our history and expect to do better in the future or create a new history. We're gonna make those mistakes again. And we need that history to learn from it. So thank you for sharing that. And um, Christian, did you have anything to share re or re reply? Um, yeah. Based on what John and Garrett shared. Yeah, Garrett, I, I love kind of the way you, you, you put all that and presented that. It was, that was great. Um, I, uh, I also see that, that people really um, can really overcome and really rise above uh, a lot of the, the circumstances, uh, but we have to really understand, uh, you know, what's actually happening now. So understanding that there is going to be a struggle, that there are things that we, we struggle with and not deny that but really just acknowledge and accept it's, it, there's a struggle here and what am I going to do? You know, what action am I going to take? Um, and to, you know, take what action you can is, is huge. And it sounds like you're doing that um, with the tremendous struggle that you're, you're facing with family having issues, family having really um, very challenging and difficult d d diseases that they're trying to overcome. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just, I, I really love the way that you put that, you know, with really kind of uh, rising above your situation and not letting it just consume you. <clears throat> I want to apply sort of what Don said was that people just aren't listening to other people. And I'm wondering, Garrett, do you think people are even listening to you or they're just 
looking at you and having assumptions. Sort of what Don was saying is that people are just, they look at other people, they size them up, and then they have this just, they assume or project so much onto them and without any regard of who that person is inside. Yeah, I think more and more data is coming out um, that has captured the, the thoughts and the feelings of, of Americans that people are increasingly afraid to have conversations uh, and to talk uh, about their feelings uh, and, uh, and, their, and their, you know, how they think about uh, these important issues that face individual communities or our, our entire country. Uh, because, you know, they are afraid of being misunderstood or misinterpreted or the ramifications uh, if they, uh, you know, say something that uh, is considered to be inappropriate. So I think we have to uh, extend more, more understanding and acceptance and grace and approach conversations with strangers and with our families with more humility. Um, you know, during, during this period of COVID, I think uh, more people in work settings are, are being more understanding and forgiving of just the craziness that comes with having kids running around and being remote and, you know, you know, having insufficient bandwidth for, for everything. So I think we have to extend that grace, that understanding throughout every part of our life. Uh, and, um, and so, yeah, I, I think people assume, I think people are afraid to have conversations and, and you know, push past assumptions. Uh, and, uh, and so that makes this moment even more challenging to navigate uh, uh, is because people uh, uh, unfortunately feel as, as though, um, you know, they're, they're not equipped, they're not capable of asking these difficult questions. Um, you know, Christian, we should, uh, you know, and if anyone else wants to, to share as well, I want to make sure that I'm not, you know, sure where Christian is facilitating this, but I know it's a group discussion. So, um, I know there are other people who would like to share as well, or even have any responses to, uh, so far what Don and, uh, Garrett had to share, but I know that we had, um, Chris, uh, Chris Surdy wanted to share. So, Chris, do you want to? Sure. Sure. Hey, can can you hear me, Bambi? Yeah. Can everyone. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Th thanks, everyone, so far for participating. I, I think, um, Christian, I think you said a couple things in your presentation that really resonated with me. It was like just kind of like blocking out the negativity, or like you know, if your people around you are saying negative things, um, you know, sort of address that. And so, you know, I think blocking out the negativity or having the strength to do that is also like a challenge for people, right? Like it's, it's so easy to let the outside world influence you. Um, and you know, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, my wife tends to tell me that I really don't care what other people think. And like, for the most part, it's kind of true. <laughs> like I love people's opinions and I love their, to tell me like what they think, but like, I'm not going to internalize it and like, let it affect me. Right. Um, as a sort of entrepreneur and sort of like angel employee, like if I let that happen to myself, I probably never would have started companies or worked for startups. Right. I would have just gone a different path. Um, the, the quick sort of antidote there is like my second company I started, I literally had people telling me, you're just a kid, you can't do it. And lo and behold, I started a company and sold it four years later. Right. And the same people who told me I was just a kid and couldn't do it or just had their mouth shut. Right. So if like you listen to the negativity and you absorb it and like you, you let it affect you, then bad things can happen. Right. And so there's, there's this, there's this piece or my position on this anyways, is like, there's this other strength piece I think that people need to focus on of like having the strength to block out that negativity or put that shield on. And so, you know, for me it personally in the recent times is, or recently has been, you know, reading the Bible a lot and just being in a lot of prayer, remembering verses like Ephesians six ten through 17, like just to continue to keep that shield on and know that like, there's bad things that happen. There's bad people. And there's a lot of stress right now. Um, but to internally be strong and to know who you are, right. And to just sort of stay confident in that in this time of negativity, it's a real challenge, but the, I personally have found the more I've done that, you know, the sort of more calm and sort of less stress and less anxiety and less fear that I've had. So I just wanted to comment on that. I think that was like, that's a big part, I think of getting through the current times. Um, I don't know if Christian had a response to that or you wanted to, yeah, on that perspective. Or... Yeah, building that inner strength is, uh, is is huge, right? I mean, if we don't have that that ability, that capability to 
uh, to take in the negative and, and work towards progress. Uh, you know, not everything people say is, is you know, is uh, something to just be thrown out. Sometimes people give you, um, you know, criticisms. Um, maybe they're constructive, maybe they're not, but they can be helpful. Um, but it's up to us to be able to kind of keep that internal strength so that we can um, utilize those things that people give us so that we can improve, so that we can um, better ourselves, so that we can be there better for other people. So, um, you know, how do we do that? How do we raise our inner strength? And, um, you know, Chris, I heard from you, you know, it sounds like your, you know, your faith helps to build you up. Um, you know, uh, for me as well, I have, uh, you know, meditation and daily check-ins, mm -hmm. family and talks with, uh, with my support network that really build me up. So I'd like to kind of put that out there for everyone else as well. Like, what do you do to build your, your own strength, you know, to build up that internal strength so that you are not so prone to this negativity bias that can kind of affect us in a real negative way. So I kind of want to put that question out for everyone. I know Dave, you wanted to share too. Maybe you want to tell us how you're getting through this. What's your go-to? <laughs> uh, first, I want to say that I'm really horrible at public speaking. So get that out of the way. I want to say hi to, to, to Mike and the Maloose. I don't know if they could hear me. But um, so yeah, um, I guess how I'm handling this, um, it's it's more economically that that I'm I'm suffering because um, I started a, few, a bunch of businesses. Um, I started a food truck last year, and then um, this year all the fest all my festivals got canceled. Uh, I opened a couple of years ago a, f a bunch of acai bowl stores, and a couple of them are open and they're doing okay, but three of them aren't gonna ever open again because our rent's too high and our, they were built around primarily schools and gyms and those are all closed. Um, last year I bought into a bar and we, we did so well during the winter, but right when COVID hit, um, you know, it got closed and we're only open for outside dining now, but that's not enough. So we don't know how much longer that's going to last. So, but I mean, the, the thing you have to do with doing these times is I guess more or less appreciate, you know, other things that you have in life and be grateful for. I, I mean, every time I travel to like a third world country or even when I used to go back to like the Philippines, like I always like to say, wow, how great I have it, you know, here in the States and how, you know, the, the things people complain about is just crazy compared to how good we really have it. And, you know, um, you know, like I, I, I just recall this one experience mm -hmm. where I was at a traffic light, stopped at a traffic light, and then I had this like four-year-old knocking on the window begging for food. And, you know, they have like, then they can't even afford clothes, like they're naked. And it's like, wow, like, you know, like, my little complaints compared to people who are living lives like this on a daily basis. It's like, wow, can I really complain? But um, I also own a barbecue sauce company. And what's actually was really good was this actually got, gave me a chance to put, put it online and it's actually doing really, really, really well online. And um, I always procrastinated. I said, I wanted to get into supermarkets and stuff. And that was like the more, more or less the end game. But all my trade shows got canceled. Supermarkets aren't taking on new products. So, you know, online was a small blessing that, um, that I pursued and it's, it's, it's doing really well. But um, yeah, I guess, I guess you gotta just roll with the punches, you know, like there's other, there's, you know, I, ta I, I taught myself piano again. <laughs> like, you know, I started doing that, you know, there's, during quarantine, I literally worked out 90 days straight indoors without taking a day off. You know, there's there's always, you, know, you could read a book, you could um, go back to school online, study something. There's always a way to like better yourself during these times. And, you know, 
that is what we do have a lot more of is time. So I think you just got to roll with the punches. And they always say after the greatest part of the storm is when the sun shines. So hopefully that sun is coming because the storm is pretty bad. <laughs> and then I also used to tell myself I need to watch the news more and like learn about like the rest of the world and what's going on. Now I don't even want to put on the news. I know, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm just like, oh, that was a bad idea. I don't want to watch the news so much. So, you know, just, I, I, for the most part, I've just always try to stay positive no matter what and just be grateful for you know, other things. <laughs> I just want to say this. This is Araceli Aguilera. Um, Dave, you can start being a public speaker, okay? Don't ever <laughs> say that you don't speak well. You speak from the heart, and that's what matters. It was beautiful. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, Dave, I think you uh, really raised a really important point is, you know, our perspective on things is our reality. So, you know, if you take the perspective of being pessimistic, of looking at fear and allowing worry to consume us, then that's going to be your reality, uh, that things are horrible, they're not going to get better, whatever it is. Um, but you're choosing consciously, intentionally to be optimistic. You're choosing to, uh, you know, see things from a different perspective that um, is, is more positive. And that, that's, that's huge because that becomes your reality. You're looking for opportunities instead of seeing all the, the negatives or the things that you don't have or the thing that, things that you've lost. You know, that, that, that's such a, a, a key place to, to come from and to function from is to really, really seeing the opportunities. Because when, you know, uh, an analogy that's very uh, um, cliche pretty much, but, you know, when one door slams, you know, another one probably blows open. So if you're able to kind of keep that positive mindset, then you can see that door that opens and you can chase after that, that opportunity that's there. It sounds like that's what you're doing. I definitely, uh, I definitely respect that for sure. Thank you. Yeah, Dave, I just wanted to say on the West Coast, we call those champagne problems. So. <laughs> <laughs> Scale problems? Champagne problems. We all got champagne problems compared to third world countries, right? So. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> I think I saw um, Ricardo put his hand up. Did you want to say something? Uh... Hey, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, well, first I want to say, actually, I uh, have a nonprofit. It's called Start Day One. Um, you know, it was actually for mental health and suicide prevention. And, you know, I'm so glad everything that I'm hearing from Christian is something that we've been telling people. So we have a very uh, proactive approach. Uh, I love what you're doing, Bambi, because this is kind of like our mindset with a mental health is that a lot of people are not actually going to come and everyone's being reactive rather than proactive. So I love what you're doing. And that's exactly what we're doing with the uh, Start Day One, trying to produce content, sending speakers proactively at different places. Uh, obviously with the COVID, that's not happening. <laughs> but um, the best things that I, I'm hearing from Christian is people, a lot of people don't understand is that you know, anxiety, depression, all that stuff. These are natural responses. But, you know, you have to remember, don't look at these as the cause. Uh, I've learned that ca a cause is never a noun. It's always an action verb. You have to figure out what's causing you to be depressed. That's why you're in depression. A lot of people think it's, I've got depression. Well, it looks like now I'm going to think negatively and be depressed. Like, that's not how it works. It's actually your perspective. And that's exactly what we actually say. I'm so glad that Christian said that. Uh, everything I've seen so far from research to just talking to people, everything always seems to stem from your perspective. You look at all the gurus you've ever seen, Tony Robbins, all the biggest ones. And it's always, you know, there's people that were suicidal and all the, the only thing that changed, it wasn't a magic pill, it wasn't a lottery, it was just their perspective that changes. And that's a really big factor. And that's why rock stars commit suicide while the homeless are trying to stay alive, you know? Um, so. You know, people have to really understand that. And when it comes to like finding solutions, so, um, you know, with Dave, I like the way you like kind of shifted what you're doing and based on your perspective, right? Because uh, entrepreneurs are really just people that hold themselves accountable, uh, you know, to monetize uh, solutions to problems. At least that's how I see them. Uh, 
And you basically just trying to figure out, you know, the solutions. And a lot of people try to always, you know, when they're solving problems, like you can't remedy the result. You have to remedy the cause, like what's causing the problem, what's happening. Um, same thing with mental health. You know, you have to really see what's causing it, not just the result of it, because everyone kind of just talks about depression, anxiety, but that's just an invisible fight you're doing when you just blame anxiety. You have to figure out what's actually making you anxious. Um, yeah, and that's really, uh, I really wanted to just give that feedback. Um, you know, thank you, Christian, for you know, spreading that kind of knowledge because I feel like that's where people get lost. Um, we've, been doing, we've been doing a lot during the, the COVID. We've been doing a lot of different um, live broadcasts and getting people in with different expertise. Uh, later this afternoon, I'm going to be talking to someone uh, that focuses on gratitude. And I know that really sh helps change your perspective on things. Um, so yeah, but just wanted to thank you guys for doing this. Um, I know I talked to Kristen, I reached out on the, uh, you know, the Vader and now uh, she got me into here. So thank you for that. Hey, hey Don, you talked a lot. Um, you talked a lot about listening and Ricardo talked about how, um, he said something that sort of touches on, on, on listening. And I guess, well, he talked about, you know, everything is about our perspective, which, I mean, that's kind of been the current theme is that we, you know, we don't look at, we don't embrace fear. We actually, we embrace hope. Um, and that's exactly what uh, both Chris and, and um, Dave have been doing is, is being hopeful. Uh, so I want to ask you, because you, you seem to be in a, in a, a place of listening a lot these days. And is, how is that changing your perspective? Yeah, it's been, I'm always constantly learning because one of the things I've been learning when people get in trouble, it's not because of what's happening in the past or the present, right? It's not what you can't see from, or what you see from the past. It's what you can't see in the future. That's where people really get in trouble with their perspectives. Um, it obviously helps when you change your perspective about the past. Um, so that really helps. And it, all it is, you're, every inspirational thing, even the information that we're doing today, um, really all we're trying to do is to change people's perspectives, right? But everything that we know, once you learn anything, everything that Christian said, everything that Chris or Dave just mentioned, it's inspirational, right? But they're all meaningless unless you actually make a decision about something. Sure. Nothing will change. Absolutely nothing. As the more I talk to people, I've learned that people are kind of insane. They complain about things they do nothing about. And it always happens. I hear it all the time. Like, oh man, my relationship, there's that same girlfriend, like same complaint from five years ago. Or, you know, this job sucks and this and that. Is the resume out? No, then that's weird. Like you just keep complaining about it. But what's funny is when people complain, I actually tell them that like, yeah, complain your ass off. Like you have to complain, but write them down because you're actually building a roadmap of what you need to work on. Like it actually sets it up for you. I want to bring in, in uh, Don. So Don, if you're still there and sort of same question I asked Ricardo and which is you're in a position of listening right now. And that's what you've said. You've been listening quite a bit. And Ricardo has talked a lot about changing your perspective. And so I wanted to ask you, Don, what, since you've been listening more, um, has that changed your perspective or how has that changed your perspective? Sure, I think Ricardo's on point. You know, we do need to have, uh, under, uh, we have to understand where it's coming, where people are coming from, where issues are coming from. Uh, the perspective that I, I mean, there's lots of different things. You said, you're right, I am listening. I'll give you one that I think is pretty interesting. I had a conversation with a friend about white supremacy. It was actually one of my small groups. Uh, the church actually put together uh, one of these Zoom conferences and talked about, you know, what do we think the problem is with the social injustice to hear what people said. And, and he was very, he just threw it out there. He's like, I think the problem is white supremacy and there's a lot of pieces to that one. And I thought about it. Um, and I haven't spoken with them, uh, but I will. Uh, what I thought was interesting was, um, you know, he's right in a lot of ways. I've read a lot of books as well since this started about, um, well, the one that I'm in the middle of right now is, um, gosh, 
the uh, miseducation of the Negro. And, and to hear um, what was taught to my black brothers and sisters going back 300 years and what people are being told, if you will, uh, that negative bias, you know, you're not equal, you're not. And for me to hear that saddens me, uh, but it also, as you mentioned earlier, history, so we don't make the same mistakes just because there was white supremacy and in some pockets, there's still plenty of that today. Uh, it needs to end. But I think for me, it all boils down to, again, going to the humanity piece of it. When I think of listening to people, I try to listen to a fil through a filter. And if we were all created by God and no one, everyone's got their own DNA again, how would God want me to treat another human being in their situation? That takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of listening. It takes a lot of um, time. Uh, Christian, you mentioned following up earlier in one of your last slides, you know, as an action step. Um, I, I, I live on my phone for texts uh, and really what it is, I just go through and I think, wow, I haven't reached out to this person in a minute. And so I do, and of course I have my text read about some of the things we talked about. And I actually text myself notes about people because people are, are the most important thing. And I think we have to, Again, to get the perspective, you also want to know where we started. You know, we're all fallen creatures. We all have issues. Um, and maybe one of our stories can help somebody. And if it can't, that's okay, too. Sometimes it's just good to listen or, as Christian also alluded to, you know, have some people that you might know who could help out. So I don't know if that answers your question. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. I was just, I, you've always been listening quite a bit, and which is why you've, um, have a good perspective already. So I was wondering how much wiser could you become? Because <laughs> you keep listening. And I think that's really what it comes down to is when we do listen, we actually do become wise about things. Um, but even, you know, even I think Dave didn't mention that he was listening, but I think what Dave was doing has been observing quite a bit, right? I guess that's the same as, as listening, observing the uh, circumstances around you and realizing what you have is pretty darn good champagne problems. Um, I will say one thing you made me think about, Dave, you made me think about you were working out quite a bit, and, which I think is great, which is I think is great. Everybody should be doing, I should do more. Well, I was going through something and I was in a really, you know, bad space and um, kind of down about something. And so I just, I just went and did all that list of those things that you're not supposed to do. Well, I did them. I went in my freezer and I grabbed a, a sandwich, ice cream sandwich. And I just like took two of them and I ate them. And I was like, there, I did it. And I was going to sulk. And then I went and I got on, jumped on the elliptical and I started doing the elliptical and crying at the same time because I was like, okay, I'm going to just, I'm going to feel sorry for myself, do all the things I'm not supposed to do, be unhealthy. But then quickly I was like, okay, I got to do it on the elliptical at least. So um, that was my, I, cause I think we have to actually sit in that, in that, for me, I feel like I have to sit in that period. I, can't, I couldn't be busy. I knew that I couldn't be busy because if I were busy, I wouldn't be thinking about it. I would just be ignoring it and it would never go away. So I grabbed my ice cream sandwiches and sat in it. So <laughs> advice for people, grab your ice cream sandwiches. Um, I think it was 1222, we're gonna be wrapping this up. And so maybe we'll just really quickly bring on Alyssa because next month we're gonna focus on relationships. And by the way, a lot of what we're talking about has to do with relationships anyway. Um, particularly, um, yeah, I mean, I think Garrett brought that up and Don, you brought that up a little bit about relationships to one another. So Alyssa, I, I'd love to have Alyssa join, jump in and just introduce herself because she's going to be the Christian for next month. So Alyssa. Hi everyone. So I'm Alyssa Morrison. I'm a licensed clinical social worker on BetterHelp as well. Um, I am thrilled to be jumping into this. Um, Christian, I've been lucky enough to come to the last two groups and he's done an awesome job, especially covering like Bambi's talking about that kind of prequel to what we're going to talk about with relationships and 
so much of that comes up when I'm talking to people now. Um, but so some of the things that I'm planning on really highlighting over the next two times that we meet are really primarily how relationships have shifted and maybe some specific stressors that are related to the pandemic. Um, but I'll certainly be talking about like strategies that will be universal to promote like positive relationships even after. But so some of that might be romantic relationships, whether you are cohabitating or it's now unfortunately it may be a really distant um, relationship depending on travel or kind of location um, and sheltering in place. I will be talking about even business relationships and how you might navigate some of those partnerships and maybe different ways of viewing like where your business goes, where it like what type of strategy for investments. Um, certainly I know that children, um, Christian kind of mentioned that whatever age they are, it's a whole new facet, whether you might be kind of joining them at the kitchen table while you're working and they're homeschooling, but maybe even adult children that are back home and, you know, navigating that as well. Um, so I am hoping that I can follow Christian well, but yeah, what that's, that's my plan. And I too am hoping that's going to be really interactive because I think that the discussion here today really, really enlightened all of us. So looking forward to it. Hopefully I'll see some familiar faces and thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. Yeah, that's gonna be great because I know that a lot of people here on the, on here are, um, you know, we all have our struggles with our, with our coworkers, right? And disagreements. So, um, so that's gonna be something um, that I'm sure that every you know people are going to want to hear about how do you actually approach them uh, with um, uh, with grace um, and how do you listen as Don said um, so with that I think Christian I don't know if if, if anybody else wanted to share um, we could probably wrap it up or if again if anyone else wanted some final words to share. I don't want to, last time we, we continued for two hours, but it's, um, it is, I know some people have hard stops. So I think, so for me, some of the takeaways that I have, um, it sounded like everyone is on the same page with this sort of changing our perspective. And I know with Chris, it sounded like you're really sitting in there in the word, internally changing that perspective and and uh, Dave you're going out there and being proactive like physically proactive but also just being um, proactive about your business and, and 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 not being idle something that I said in the very beginning that sparked me to move was that I wasn't going to be idle because if I sat idle then I'd be nihilistic and I wasn't going to go there and I think, Don, you're listening quite a bit more. So it sounds like everybody is changing their habits, changing their routines um, and for the better. And, um, and so that's positive. And, and I hope that that's the, that, that's the type of lessons and um, the lessons we can take forward every single, um, every single month as we continue through this program. Um, Kristen, do you have any final words to say? Final closing remarks? Yeah, absolutely. I, I did want to also just thank everyone that shared, um, that uh, shared their stories, shared uh, support as well for, for all of us here. And um, I just wanted to kind of highlight those, the last slide that I had on the presentation, which kind of gives kind of four steps to kind of continue to work through loneliness, fear, anxiety. Um, which is basically just to be present first, you know, just be present with the feeling, you know, if we can be more present with ourselves, with others, then we're going to um, be able to go to the second step, which is acknowledging that, that there's a difficulty here, that there is a, a feeling or an emotion that is challenging and that it is naturally challenging, that we need to address it. And then the third step of that is really kind of asking yourself, 
what is needed here? You know, whether it's you asking yourself, you asking a family member, a member of your team, a member of your community, you know, what do you need? What do I need? And then allowing yourself to kind of take action, that fourth step, really taking action and not just sitting with it, not sitting and letting, letting the worry continue, not allowing fear or anxiety to develop, um, but just really acknowledging it, being present with it and asking what is needed and then taking that action so that you can work towards uh, resolving it and to moving forward. <clears throat> just like the question that I had that in both of my essays, what are you going to do with the time given to you? So I always ask that, what am I doing in this time? If this time was given to me for a purpose and maybe it doesn't feel great, but it was given to me for a purpose. And um, that's what keeps me going. I do wanna say that for anybody here is participating or who will participate going forward, um, you will get a uh, trial, a free trial with BetterHelp if you want to try that. I will send out an email to everyone so you'll uh, be able to get a link and check that out. And also they do group webinars uh, frequently. Um, Christian moderates those group webinars and that just comes with the, with, with the membership. So um, please you know, try that. We are going to get back again together in August. So I hope you guys will join us. I love your stories. They are helping me through this time. And just talking about relationships, we, that is going to be such a topic. Uh, because, you know, I live in a house with eight people. But I'll tell you, and, and there's different relationship dynamics going on. Um, I could even feel lonely in those, those times. So, um, but that's a really important um, conversation to have around relationships. So I, I really hope you join us. Thank you so much for the sharing. You have no idea how much that just hearing, hearing your stories just changes me, even a little bit. Um, and I think, again, we need those stories. We need, we need people to hear us and just, just here, just, just to sit, just to sit, Dave, just for you to share that story. I hope that was helpful for Chris. I hope that was helpful for you to just share your story because it, it affected all of us. I hope definitely affected me. So with that, I'm not going to uh, keep you guys any longer. Please enjoy your day and thank you again, BetterHelp. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Christian, for guiding us through this. Have a wonderful day and we will see you in August. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.